Majetica was invited uh, for a show at Hamburger Bahnhof, which was looking into the interdisciplinary field between visual art and architecture or the um, uh, reflection of architectural issues in visual arts. I immediately thought that Majetica's practice would be a very good uh, example. Uh, since she is um, an artist, but also an architect. And um, I was very impressed by her um, double, um, um, how would I yes. describe it? Um, practice practice uh, uh, in, in the field of um, social, uh, environmental, and architectural field work. Uh, and also on her sculptural and, as she says, architectural case studies that she presents in institutional context. And so she presented a work um, which she developed in Caracas. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is also a starting point for our conversation now, since uh, in the other room there is the dry toilet. Uh, a project which started in Caracas when you were first there in 2003. So um, maybe you uh, tell us a little bit about your research that you did yeah, there. Yeah, it, it, it's actually, uh, this was a groundbreaking uh, experience for me. Uh, I was uh, asked to stay half a year in Caracas, uh, working in the informal city of Caracas. And architects who organized uh, the whole um, Residency. They had no contact in the informal city. It was it was just like uh, some a, a cloud that no one knew what it is. We just they, we just knew we wanted to understand it a little bit. And the money came from German Cultural Foundation at the time when uh, Germany has problems with the shrinking cities. And German Cultural Foundation they had this. Uh, very good idea to study the fast growing city, which is informal city. Mm -hmm. Now you have to remember this is many years ago, like 15 years ago yes. or so, uh, when there was, there was no informal city in any architecture magazine, which is completely different from today, right? Yes, yeah. and I think um, maybe one has to explain uh, that a city like Caracas has a modernist uh, city um, and then next to this modernist part of the city there are these fast growing informal cities which have their own structures which you have studied carefully um, so maybe from the outside one could think that it's completely unorganized but then you yeah, learn that there is yeah. a lot of infrastructure mm -hmm. that uh, is a sort of bottom up uh, structure that people develop there in smaller communities. Yes. Uh, right. Well, you know, the typical cliche about informal city is that it's a, it's a chaos, but actually it's super organized uh, structure, uh, basically uh, organized by uh, residents themselves. Uh, the state is not present, I can say. There is no public space, but it's a community space, it's present. And uh, there is a, there, they have all the hospitals and libraries, but you're not able to read it from the, you know, from the facades of the buildings. Everything goes uh, like regulations. They have oral regulations. We have written regulations. So you cannot change anything by uh, just you know, doing it yourself. You have to have a consent from the community. Mm -hmm. So it's really, uh, we were really impressed by the self-organization. I also have to say we were very lucky when we worked in uh, La Vega uh, Barrio in, in Caracas that uh, the part we worked in had no drug problems. Mm -hmm. uh, so the community was very well organized and they took care of uh, yeah, their rights, basically. Yeah. And when you were first there, uh, you have been there alone or with the yeah. students? Yes, so no, I was uh, invited there alone mm -hmm. 
It was also a groundbreaking project, not only because they asked us to stay there six months, mm -hmm. but it was also like a, um, a group of very different profiles. Uh, architects, uh, artists, photographers, uh, urban anthropologists, uh, I don't know, like a lot of different people, uh, which was very unusual at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did learn a lot together from each other. And the idea behind the, this, the, the, right. the, 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 the whole project was actually to learn about informal city. Just during the six months you have to learn and we, you have to have something to show us after six months, but we had completely open hands. And uh, with my collaborator, Lia Tesako, who, is, uh, who at the time was a young Israeli architect, we decided immediately to start on uh, collaboration with residents of, of a barrio and to focus on uh, resilience or on re resilience of the barrio communities mm -hmm. and self-sustainability if you want because all of these structures are built by, by people themselves. And we came up to, to construct with them a dry toilet uh, which doesn't need any water to operate in a part of the barrio where there was no access to running water at all. Like in other parts of barrios, which were more down towards the valley, you could have, for instance, uh, water twice per week for a few hours. So water was really an important and pressing issue, especially for the barrio community at the time. Now it's also for people who live in the former city. Uh, so when we started to talk about the water, the community got completely passionate and is it possible to construct a toilet that doesn't need any water to operate. And, uh, eventually we, we put up one together with the community construction workers mm -hmm. and it's still there operating happily. And uh, <laughs> what, is it only one which is uh, operating yeah. still, or yeah. uh, That's a, a good few question. others? Uh, there are a few others. Yeah. At, at some point, also the main hydro capital, I think it was called, the main water company in Caracas, they had an idea mm -hmm. to put up uh, props of dry toilet in every neighborhood so that people yeah. could understand what it is and to mm -hmm. learn from it. I thought it was a pretty wild idea. <laughs> it didn't come true, but the, a few more dry toilets were built in the former city. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah but I mean, this was a very uh, typical, I would say, uh, process that you go to a certain place, you, you make contact with the mm -hmm. community and, and you try to come up with proposals that you develop together with. Yeah. And in a community, yeah. Um, yeah. and I think that's something um, that you also brought with you when you started teaching in, in Hamburg at the academy mm -hmm. in 2011. Yes, 2011. And I, I have to read it because it has, it's a very nice um, um, program. Uh, design for the living world was mm -hmm. uh, the class you were teaching, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, I think it's a very good title because um, um, it shows that your work uh, really is uh, about social practices and how social practices form, let's say, constructions and that um, it's about the social uh, communication um, Mm. which is maybe in the center of, of your interest. Mm. Yes, it is. So uh, when I was uh, going back to Caracas, when, I, when we made a project there with Lia, together with the community, I said, this is how I want to work in the future. Mm. I just found my way of, I said, yes, this is the way how I want to work in the future. And when I was invited uh, to teach students at Hagbeka uh, Hamburg, uh, I applied a very similar uh, ideas behind my teaching, namely that we didn't do uh, one-day workshops or three-day wor workshops, but re we really tried to live and work together with communities for a longer period of time. I'm mostly proud, I'm really proud on the Soweto project where we stayed mm -hmm. and worked in uh, the local community for three months. 
which is uh, a lot if you think that uh, the students go out of the school for three months to um, learn from communities that maybe sometimes are um, approached as if they would have to learn from uh, the mm -hmm. uh, modernist uh, cityscapes and yes. the environments yeah. they can't afford uh, when they live in um, informal cities, uh, barrios um, or um, areas which, where they build their houses from what they find and for I think students to try to start a communication with people uh, from which they can also learn that it's not... Exactly, yeah. it's uh, like it's learning from yeah. each other, it's yeah. very important not to work for a community but to work with the community yeah. and this is the way how things happen. So and this is one part of this double practice uh, which I uh, um, I was speaking about at the beginning uh, and then after such a process in the community then uh, you have your architectural case study mm -hmm. which you present in the institution in a museum space um, which is related to this uh, community project but it's also an um, autonomous work in itself or one can look at it um, as an autonomous work in itself um, which is accompanied by also drawings. Uh, Marietta does this uh, series of drawings which uh, come with a certain project um, and uh, here we have a drawing which goes with the uh, dry toilet project and this goes with the uh, drop city uh, project and um, what I learned from Marietta when we showed uh, one of her architectural case studies, the Caracas Growing Houses. Maybe some of you have seen it at Hamburger Bahnhof. We have presented it also um, last year in the main hall. That was the second time that we uh, showed it. Actually, we acquired it for the collection, which is quite an ambitious uh, um, object to collect because each time when we show it, we have to build it again. So we keep a few of the uh, building materials. We have a good manual and then we build it up again from scratch uh, following the, the, the drawings. But then uh, when we did it for the second time last year, uh, we, we did it and then my editor came and, and I thought it looks pretty much as the, the <laughs> drawing and uh, the photographs we have from the first time. But then it was um, interesting, said no, a few things have to be changed on the roof. Uh, so uh, I learned that you have very precise ideas for the uh, architectural case studies when they are then in an institutional context. Yes. Yeah. So well it's every every work of art art has an integrity as you yes. know. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance the Drop City giant actually developed through a few years but now I think it's the final version. And <laughs> if you would put it again maybe I would say and come and say, oh well maybe this should be the other way because this is how it really lives well. A piece is like a living mm -hmm. work, no? Mm -hmm. But there it's interesting because uh, in the context we can mention the dry toilet project here, uh, which is architectural case study, which is basically, I think, unique in my, uh, or not, they don't have a lot of works like this that develop. Uh, mm -hmm. This is ninth variation of the dry toilet and each variation was completely different because uh, I made it together with the, with the Kasha institution or a gallery or the museum that wanted to exhibit the piece. Basically I, I uh, experimented with collaborating with curators. Uh, so I, so I, I didn't want to control uh, the piece completely but of course the important thing is that it's, uh, the piece is about the lack of water. Mm -hmm which is yes. at the center yeah. of this piece, yes. yeah. Yeah. whereas uh, with the Caracas uh, growing houses uh, it was really about an architectural 
principle mm. um, in the informal city. Mm. Um, I think the combination of these two works is uh, very interesting because it um, shows that uh, on the one hand side uh, you refer to and learn from these communities, from these um, um, villages, uh, sometimes rural areas, maybe we can also speak a little bit about that later, where you learn from the communities there, whereas this project refers to Buckminster Fuller's uh, ideas um, from the 50s and 60s, his geodesic dome, and uh, by referring to a figure like Buckminster Fuller, we can learn that you very clearly also know visionary um, proposals from, from the uh, recent history uh, which had developed ideas about uh, working together, uh, developing to Together, uh, projects for the future which uh, become more and more relevant today. So Buckminster Fuller would be one figure which is still uh, always exciting to, to learn from and to study, but another one is Jona Friedman, uh, the architect who um, also developed um, concepts about um, working together, participation and um, his notion um, that he was very uh, uh, keen on, I have to find it, uh, was um, self-reliance, participation, and that he wanted to, pe to teach people um, that participated in architectural uh, processes that they learned self-reliance. And I think this uh, is something that I also see in your work. Um, but maybe, I don't know if the notion yeah. of self-reliance is I mean, important for you. Yes, of course it is. And uh, at this point I also think about it, uh, the fact that I come from Slovenia, which is a very small country. And uh, you somehow always feel uh, the boundaries of, the, of, the, of your community. So somehow I uh, lived uh, all, all of my youth mm -hmm. in a community that was uh, well defined. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially uh, my uh, career as a young artist was very uh, important for me in Ljubljana because uh, this was before the political changes. It was very vivid. The scene was very vivid. We didn't have art market, but the discussions were and the discussions were very vivid, and uh, the production was immense. And uh, yeah, I, I think this. Uh, to I consider myself a conceptual artist. So I think I have to, uh, due to to my upbringing in Ljubljana. But then you also, I mean, you have this personal experience. But then you also <coughs> study. Uh, let's say, communities um, in different parts of the world and models like mm -hmm. the Drop City com yeah. Commune project is an historic exactly. example, but you have also traveled to Israel to, to study the kibbutz um, uh, models. So um, I think you, you make a research in different parts of the world how communities um, function, yeah. how models can be developed together um, and uh, it was interesting to me that you um, explained um, when looking at this series of drawings that you think um, there was a period between 1968 um, and 2008 that this is a, a period um, of uh, a strong neoliberal capitalism which comes to a certain end in, with the financial crisis in 2008 and then afterwards other impulses became more yeah. uh, important again. Yeah. So, so yeah, so today we are talking about a, a lot, there are a lot of ideas to develop uh, what, is, what is the future. Yeah. And uh, I was just reminded by a friend that it's like 30 years since the fall of Berlin Wall okay. when, uh, when mm -hmm. there was an uh, idea of the end of history. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, because everything just became pure capitalism, 
and uh, suddenly this idea of the another world is possible came was very important and we are still in this together thinking about the future other future possible worlds and uh, you cannot do it just by talking you have to have your get your hands dirty and uh, the the drop city community from the 60s or the circuit project which was initiated by uh, three of my students in uh, Hamburg in 2015 are examples of these laboratories where we can think about uh, possible futures mm -hmm. uh, because of course uh, capitalism is not all over uh, we have to think of different futures yeah so um, uh, it's uh, a coincidence yesterday uh, I attended the opening of the, a new space in Berlin called Futurium. Uh -huh. um, so it's a whole building now that's dedicated <laughs> to <laughs> questions future. of how do we want to live together uh, in the future. And um, when I came here today, I thought, oh, they just should uh, study Mariettica's work, and then they <laughs> would have very good ideas uh, to start from. Uh, instead, they have sort of science uh, exhibition and. Uh, um, a lot of uh, areas where you can play with um, <coughs> some uh, uh, designed elements, um, but uh, I think these issues can be really studied um, in your work and um, one aspect which I think you have also touched and which um, is also uh, referred to in this drawing in the back, mm -hmm. um, which is a um, diagrammatic uh, mm -hmm. drawing um, compared to this series. So you have drawing series and drawing diagrams. Um, this, this one refers to your uh, travel to Australia mm -hmm. and to learning from people in a rural area I would mm -hmm. now say in a rural area with the Aborigines, where, which you met there. Yes. So yes. you visited uh, sure. yeah. uh, a certain community. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, what was interesting, I, I stayed in Australia two months, which was basically a research project. I didn't uh, put up anything, but I, we talked with a lot of people, and I got the, the focus of, of the drawing probably for me is the, the thesis that. Uh, Aboriginals survived uh, colonialization and capitalism uh, and they are for some reason still keen to share their knowledge with us. Um, us meaning uh, Western civilization that completely, how do you say, uh, nearly killed them off. Uh, but before the Western, uh, the Western survived in, in 17th century, I think it was, uh, the land management by Aboriginals in Australia was perfect. And of course today when we are facing the exit of the social state and uh, climate change, we of course look into uh, the wisdoms of old uh, peoples, no? That we, uh, like, uh, like what the Westerns brought to Australia was the idea of ownership, they brought the idea of fences and so on. This is exactly what Aboriginals didn't do. So it's uh, basically a lot of things to, to learn about and also to be aware that it's sort of fantastic that, uh, that uh, you know, to be human also means to share knowledge, I would say. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, only recently, um, let's say to a larger extent, um, uh, Western um, scientists and uh, cultures are more open to, to learn from indigenous cultures when we face now this situation that we have exploited the earth and the resources to an extent that it really endangers our future life, sure, that we yeah. might uh, better listen a little bit better to them because yeah. they have a different relationship towards the mm. resources mm. and that we come into a phase where it might be important for our uh, survival to learn from them. Exactly. Uh, I mean, only at that moment we start to be mm -hmm. attentive more. Mm -hmm. uh, for In other aspects, we are still uh, exploiting uh, all the resources yeah. that 
but are I, needed for yeah, such a life. I really think that it's the question of survival. We we have to open our minds and hearts to to other ways of doing mm. and thinking.